So I would uh, really like to begin by thanking the organizers of this conference, especially Tanya for inviting me. Um, and as she said, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Arizona State University. And uh, today I will be talking to you about the role that non-adaptive non evolutionary processes play in shaping genomic variation. So as we all know, inference in population genetics is largely performed by taking a snapshot of a natural population at any point in time. Using this genome-wide sequence variation between individuals obtained allows us to infer the past genealogy and parameters of evolutionary processes that have acted on this population, like selection, mutation, recombination, and genetic drift that is specific to the demographic history of this population. Now, all of these processes can leave somewhat similar imprints across the genome, and it has been a challenge to distinguish the individual effects of these evolutionary processes. Of course, one solution um, has, been, in order to distinguish selection from all these other processes has been to assume that selection only influences the trajectories of alleles at directly selected sites, that is sites that are functionally important, while the non-adaptive processes affect all sites. And so we can use the non-functional or so, so to speak neutral sites to infer parameters of non-adaptive processes, for instance, parameters defining past population size changes. So basically, most present methods assume that all sites evolve independently. However, because functional and non-functional sites are linked to each other on a chromosome, selection acting on a few sites can really affect the dynamics of nearby neutral mutations in the population. Just to tell you a little bit more about that, let's assume that this solid block here represents a region of the genome that is under direct selection. So any neutral mutation that occurs near a directly selected site could occur on a background that has a beneficial mutation. In this case, this neutral mutation would sweep through the population with the beneficial mutation, and this will result in a decrease in decreasing variation at this neutral site. Um, and this process is often referred to as selective sweeps. Alternatively, if this neutral mutation had occurred on a background with a deleterious mutation, the neutral mutation is likely to be lost and not allowed to segregate in the population, again, decreasing variation at this um, neutral site. And this process is called background selection. Now, there has been a lot of ongoing debate about whether generally patterns of neutral variation across the genome, if they are affected predominantly by sweeps or by background selection. And this has been a debate for so many decades because all of these evolutionary processes live similar imprints in population genetic data, making it very challenging to disentangle them from each other. So the two questions that have driven my research are what is the role of adaptive versus non-adaptive processes in shaping genome-wide variation? And how can we disentangle these evolutionary processes from each other using population genomic data? And we think that in order to address this debate, it's important to jointly account for the contribution of constantly and commonly operating processes in natural populations. For instance, um, it turns out now that multiple studies, experimental and computational, have measured the distribution of fitness effects of new mutations. And they've all concluded that most new mutations in functional regions are deleterious. Um, as you can see by the red um, and the sort of white tail here, all of these mutations are deleterious. And so um, we expect background selection to be much more per pervasive. And we know that it is a continuously acting, um, it, it is continuously acting in populations. So it should really be accounted for when generating null expectations of models and population genetics. Similarly, we know that natural populations are constantly experiencing fluctuations in population size. Thus, effects of this relatively large input of deleterious mutations and fluctuations in population size jointly represent the appropriate evolutionary null model on which the importance of more periodic processes like positive selection can be assessed. In fact, not accounting for deleterious mutations can affect inference of population genetic parameters obtained under assumptions of complete neutrality. So today, I will specifically be focusing on consequences of not accounting for deleterious mutations, that is background selection, um, when performing demographic inference. Um, and then I will talk about uh, potential 
uh, possible solution and how we applied it to Drosophila melanogaster. And I will end with a little bit um, about model rejection versus model fitting. So it turns out that mutations, when they are strongly deleterious, um, they simply decrease the general level of um, overall diversity on nearby sites. However, when the strength of selection against deleterious mutations is small, they can segregate in populations for a while before they are perched, and uh, thus they end up changing the allele frequency of nearby neutral mutations. Um, so what really happens is that background selection results in an increase in the proportion of rare alleles at these linked neutral sites. And uh, what this means is that deleterious mutations can skew the expect expected distribution of allele frequencies from neutrality. For instance, shown here is a site frequency spectrum, or the SFS, which is a histogram of the derived allele frequencies. The black bar here shows you the expected SFS under neutrality and demographic equilibrium. The red bars show you the SFS of a neutral allele experiencing background selection, but it is the population is still of a constant size. And as you can see, background selection skews the expected distribution of allele frequencies towards rare variants. Here, I've added the site frequency spectrum resulting from a tenfold and a 20-fold growth in a population that is under complete neutrality, and that's in green. And as you can see, there's not much difference between the SFS from a population that experienced a tenfold growth and a population that is under equilibrium but has sites closely linked to functional sites. So this suggests that not accounting for effects of linkage to deleterious mutations must affect inference of population sizes obtained under assumptions of complete neutrality. So today I will be talking, um, oh, okay, right. So, uh, and you know, we know that um, when, we, when we generally perform population genetic inference, we ignore this deviation. Uh, for instance, um, demographic inference is performed using synonymous sites or sites from introns or intergenic regions. And all of these sites are actually, or can be very close to other functionally important sites. So they must experience substantial background selection, um, distorting this expected distribution of allele frequencies. And so we suspected that not accounting for effects of linkage in certain cases will confound the inference of demography. So what we did is we simulated human-like genomes comprising of 22 chromosomes of 150 MB each and mimicked sort of the intron, exon, intergenic structure in human genomes. Um, the exons here all experienced purifying selection, while introns and intergenic regions were completely neutral. And we then used, um, right, and then we used these neutral regions, intron and intergenic regions, to perform demographic inference, which is what people would normally do. Um, we did that using two very different um, types of uh, methods or programs. So FASIMCOL, um, it's a method that, that um, fits uh, models of population size change using the site frequency spectrum from the data. Um, and MSMC, the other one we used was MSMC, which is again very widely used. Um, MSMC simply walks along a, along a diploid genome and uses the positions of homozygous versus, versus heterozygous sites to infer the distribution of the time to the most recent common ancestor across the genome, which can then be used to infer the historical population sizes under a coalescent model of mutation and recombination. So um, let me show you what we found. Here, the black line shows you the true population size that we simulated with time going from right to left. So it goes backwards. Inferences of population sizes are given in red and blue, with uh, red being in MSMC, blue being in Fasim Coal. Um, and so what you see here is that even when the true model has no size change, that is, it's a constant population, um, recent growth is inferred by both of these programs. And uh, both methods also underestimate the true population size by an order of magnitude, which is uh, sort of expected. Interestingly, when there really is recent growth, inference is pretty accurate. However, if the population has undergone a recent decrease in size, a bottleneck here, then there's an inference of an even stronger growth. So it's interesting to see that different demographic histories produce different extent of link selection and therefore different extent of misinference. 
Um, and so these observations strongly suggest the need for jointly estimating these two evolutionary forces. Um, in fact, as one would predict, the higher the proportion of the functional sites in the genome, the stronger is the misinference of demographic history. So in our case, it turns out that if, if only five to 10% of the genome was functional, um, then inference was pretty accurate. Um, but uh, once 20% once, um, of the genome was functional, there was a pretty strong misinference. Um, so in fact, uh, current demographic inference methods, they all assume neutrality and they have been applied across a variety of species despite their very different coding densities. Um, only about 10 to 15%, and this is probably a maximum here uh, of the human genome that is predicted to be functional. So most likely these methods work fine in human genomes. Um, however, um, there are many other model organisms that have a variety of uh, density of coding sites. For example, Arabidopsis and C. elegans have about 30% of their genome being functional. Uh, Drosophila melanogaster and yeast, about 50 to 60%. And really unicellular eukaryotes can go from like 60 to 80% of their genomes being functional. And so um, such methods may or may not be applicable for species with such compact genomes. So what might be a potential solution to this issue? Well, one solution is, as I mentioned earlier, can we perform a joint inference of both of these evolutionary forces and um, will that work? So what we tried to do here is, um, so we created a method where basically the idea was to sort of model a functional element of a very specific length, let's say the specific length of the exon or a regulatory region, um, along with its flanking intergenic regions. Um, and we specifically model the, the specific recombination and mutation rate um, in that region. And then we attempted to infer both the distribution of fitness effects of deleterious mutations and the demographic history simultaneously. Um, and in this case, we parametrized the distribution of fitness effects as comprising of sort of four non-overlapping uniform distributions whose proportions we inferred. And so we had four parameters to infer here. And um, what we did is we used a simulation-based Bayesian method called approximate Bayesian computation or ABC in which values of these parameters say ancestral and current population sizes are drawn from a prior distribution, which we assumed was uniform. And simulations for all pairs of these randomly drawn ancestral and current population sizes are conducted usually. Um, then you calculate statistics from all of these different simulations and comparing these statistics obtained from simulations to the observed data uh, that you already have, ABC, um, generates a posterior distribution of most likely values of both of these parameters. So um, in this case, our idea was to try to use the recovery of background selection effects um, as we move away from the functional element. And this was done by calculating statistics in different windows in the non-coding regions as we move away from the functional region, capturing the gradient of these selection effects. Links, link selection effects. So we found that our method performed extremely well. The x-axis here shows you the true value while the y-axis shows you the estimated value. And the black line is the x equals y line. So the first four plots correspond to parameters of the distribution of fitness effects, that is selection, and the last two correspond to, to demographic history. And as you can see, we perform really quite well in this kind of joint inference framework. Um, we also tried doing this by simply reducing it, uh, this inference to just a functional region um, and not including the non-functional regions around it. In this case, we introduce a little bit more error. Um, however, the method still performs reasonably well. Uh, the significance of, of this is that it, such a method can work really well in something like unicellular species or like bacterial species, species where basically, um, most of the genome is, is functionally important, for instance. So there are a number of aspects of this framework that are extremely novel and also very useful in practice. Um, first, we can fit multiple aspects of the data. So we can account for allele frequencies, but also the linkage disequilibrium and divergence um, 
from a closely um, from a close population. Um, we can also account for linkage effects of deleterious mutations. Um, thirdly, uh, we can use uh, functional regions directly to perform inference. Um, and we can, th that means that we can also infer the DFE of regulatory regions like promoter or enhancer regions using this method. Um, and as I said earlier, it can also be used in non-model organisms where we really don't know which sites are neutral and which are not. Finally, another advantage of this method is that we didn't really make any assumptions about which sites in the coding region are neutral or not neutral, uh, which means that um, if there was selection on synonymous sites, such a thing would not affect our inference method. Um, and uh, in, in fact, currently, um, mo most inference, uh, like DFE inference methods, they usually just assume that all synonymous sites are neutral. And this of course works in many organisms, uh, but again, in, in the more compact the genome, um, the more likely it is that synonymous sites could be under selection. So uh, we try to look at um, how our method would perform if uh, there was selection on synonymous sites. So here, what we did is we uh, simulated that 30% of synonymous sites were experiencing weak selection, um, purifying selection again. Um, and what you're going to see here, um, th the black bars are going to be true values. Blue bars show you our ABC inference and these patterned black and white bars show you the inference uh, by a method DFE alpha, which is extremely widely used and sort of a standard in inferring the um, distribution of fitness effects. So uh, first I'm going to show you the inference when population is in equilibrium. The left, le left side shows you the DFE parameters and the right side shows you the full change in population size that was inferred. So uh, as you can see, DFE alpha infers an almost twofold growth under equilibrium, which is of course expected in this case, um, and underestimates the proportion of weakly deleterious class of mutations. Our method, however, performs accurately. The same holds for growth and decline um, here where DFE alpha overestimates the full change in growth and actually estimates growth instead of decline, um, if there is even a little bit of selection on synonymous sites. So um, our, our method can perform decently well in accounting for selection on synonymous sites. So what we did next is to apply it to a population of Drosophila melanogaster, uh, specifically the Zambian population. So um, what you see here on top is the previous estimates of population size change in colorful lines. Um, so this population was previously estimated to have undergone a twofold growth recently, or perhaps a little bit more. And uh, here the X axis again is time in the number of generations going back in time. We infer almost no change in population size as it is shown in this black line. Um, instead, we end up inferring a much larger proportion of mildly deleterious class of mutations as compared to previous studies, which are again shown in, in as colorful bars here. And this is, if, if, just to remind you, this is actually in line with the expectation that if you neglect background selection, one will infer recent growth, even if the population is under equilibrium. And it seems that our model can sufficiently explain the statistics in the Zambian population. So what you're seeing here, these, these um, gray histogram distributions are simply the, uh, the distribution of these statistics um, if we simulate a model based on our inferred parameters. And the black line here showing you um, the estimates from actual Drosophila Zambian population. So, um, our model is able to decently or, or pretty decently um, explain um, genome-wide variation in the Zambian population. So now that we have a model for this population, we can go ahead and ask if there is anything we can say about the strength and extent of positive selection in this population. So we sort of tested four different scenarios where positive selection was either common and strong, common and weak, rare and strong, and rare and weak. Um, so all four um, scenarios. Common in this case was always 5% and rare was 
strong selection was a coefficient of 1,000, that is a 2NS of 1,000, and a weak was a, a 2NS of 10. And uh, we looked at the effect of positive selection by first simulating our inferred model in Drosophila, which comprised of the demographic history and purifying selection that we just inferred. Um, and this is shown in dark gray, actually. Uh, and then we added positive selection on top of that, which was in light gray. And the red line here will represent the mean of the actual observed data in Drosophila. So when positive selection was really strong, uh, but only rare, which is this scenario, um, we see that um, expect they, here we're looking at the expectations of haplotype diversity, uh, which is a summary of the linkage disequilibrium in the population. And it's very two between the to very different between these two scenarios. And it turns out that the actual data is always better explained by only demographic history and purifying selection. In fact, when positive selection is strong and common, these distributions are even more distinct and the data is even more consistent with an absence of such strong positive selection. Similarly, we simulated weak positive selection. When positive selection is weak, um, whether it is common or it is rare, most statistics are actually more or less unchanged. Um, they overlap significantly between the two scenarios. Um, so, so in the presence of deleterious mutations, it's a bit difficult to disentangle uh, weak positive selection. Um, we did observe that when weak positive selection was extremely common, that is 5%, it, it resulted in a much larger divergence than could be explained by the data, which was sort of inconsistent um, with, what we, um, with what could be possible. And so in conclusion, we know that much less than 1% of all mutations are beneficial. Um, and that is consistent with observations in the Drosophila population. And although common and weak positive selection seems unlikely, rare and weak positive selection is definitely completely consistent with the data. Um, and so we thus conclude that demography and purifying selection alone could be sufficient to explain most patterns of observed data in Drosophila Zambian populations. So here a point that I would like to make is that by forming an appropriate null model, our approach allowed us to reject a specific, uh, some specific evolutionary scenarios that is of strong and frequent positive selection. And uh, this, this is somewhat important because an alternative approach would be to have no null model, but to simply assess the fit of multiple models. And I think that one has to be cautious going down that avenue. Uh, for instance, one can technically fit a model of growth quite confidently to an equilibrium population that is experiencing background selection, but that wouldn't really reveal its true evolutionary history. Similarly, one can always fit a model of positive selection to basically any observed pattern, um, especially when only a single statistic is considered, for example. Um, it does not, however, make that the correct estimate. So um, just for a little bit longer, I, I just want to talk a little bit about this model fitting versus model rejection. Um, so we decided to look at this a little bit more formally. Uh, so what we, what we did in this case is we simulated a Drosophila-like genome, uh, of actually just a 100 KB element, um, which has intron exon structures like Drosophila. Um, and, uh, and in this case, 50% of the genome was functional. So, and then we then looked at patterns of variation in these neutral regions, again, which were the intron and the intergenic regions. And we just asked, uh, can we fit them, can we fit this to um, say a model of demographic history that assumes complete neutrality, which is what we do currently. And, um, oh, sorry. And can we also fit it um, to a model of recurrent positive selection that assumes an equilibrium population, which means in this scenario, there are only beneficial and neutral mutations, which is what a lot of people do uh, when we currently study sort of uh, sweep effects or, or general positive selection effects. Um, and what we did in these cases is we, um, like for demographic history, we sort of fit an ancestral and current population size. For the positive selection model, we fit a mean strength of positive selection and the fraction of beneficial substitutions. Actually, the, yeah, the fraction of beneficial new mutations. And in this case, we used an ABC approach again. However, um, that's simply to sort of demonstrate the point um, or to sort of investigate this issue. Um, so 
shown here are joint posteriors of the estimated parameters um, here in black. So all of the black lines here show you the actual inferred uh, parameters. The red crosses, they show you the true value that we simulated. So going through it slowly, like um, as you can see, if the population is under equilibrium and say there are, that there's only uh, the input of deleterious mutation in this population, we can quite confidently fit it to a small growth model and actually to pretty moderate positive selection, in this case, um, up to an S of about 40. Um, and if we next add a frequent positive selection, we see that, of course, we would infer a pretty large recent growth in the population. That's what we do um, if we assume neutrality. Um, um, uh, so, so that's, you know, so uh, positive selection obviously also has a pretty strong effect on demographic inference. Um, similarly, if we um, assume that recombination and mutation rates vary across the genome, uh, but let's say that they are not accounted for in our inference, um, so we don't account for this variation in these rates, um, then as we can see, we will end up inferring a much stronger sense strength of positive selection, but we will end up underestimating the total fraction of beneficial mutations as one would expect in this scenario. Um, and then we add in uh, demographic history change. So let's assume the population is no longer in cons as, a, as a, a constant population as, and in fact has um, experienced a decline. So in this case, um, if you don't account for that, then uh, you will estimate very large strength of positive selection. Um, so in short, um, we can fit a model of complete neutrality or of only positive selection to almost any evolutionary scenario quite confidently. Uh, but unless we jointly account for effects of all of these evolutionary processes, we are more likely to be wrong when performing such inference. And this is one of the reasons why joint estimators are a possible solution down this road. Um, so in summary, not accounting for deleterious mutations can bias population genetic methods that assume complete neutrality like demographic inference. By making statistical methods that account for linked effects of selection, we can get accurate inference of both from population genomic data. And it's important to construct an appropriate evolutionary null model accounting for evolutionary processes certain to be occurring in natural populations against which contribution of episodic processes can be better assessed. So with that, I would like to thank you for listening. Um, all of the work presented today was performed under the mentorship of Jeffrey Jensen at Arizona State University and Brian Charlesworth at the University of Edinburgh. Kellen Ryle is a fantastic undergraduate researcher who I've been mentoring and who has contributed heavily to one of the projects. I would also like to thank all of our other collaborators and the Open Science Crit, and I can take any questions.